so so wait. So who's watching the flanks when they attack? The Romanians are. They are, huh? Are are they as good as the opposition? Uh, not really. Not really. Well, they better get it over quick then, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bye. See it. October 9th, 1942. You did not want to do this offensive. You said so many times. Your war games showed that the whole thing was risky, and all summer long, you've been plagued by shortages of men and machines, and now, now the offensive is at its peak in terms of blood and carnage. How do you feel now? Does it matter that you've been promised great things in future when you win? It sure does, and this week you are singing a different tune. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Axis offensive in the Caucasus stalled, needing reinforcements and supplies to continue. The fighting in Stalingrad grew ever more intense, though, as the focus turned to the factory district and the Mamayev Kurgan. Vasily Chuikov's Soviet 62nd Army is in a pretty bad position. At the beginning of October, Chuikov 62nd held a 12-mile front in Stalingrad with a depth varying from 250 meters to 2,500 meters. All movement in this dangerously comprised area was confined to the hours of darkness. Regrouping was a hazardous affair now that the ferry traffic was so constricted, since the German seizure of parts of Stalingrad to the south, from Tsaritsa to Kuporoznoye and northwards to Mamayev Kurgan, enabled them to look out over large stretches of the city and direct their guns against the ferries. 1,000 yards of water, the Volga crossing, was raked by German gunfire and became the daily hunting ground for German aircraft. Considerable sections of the northern and central parts of Stalingrad were in German hands. The Volga is actually on fire as the week begins, and yet this turns out to be a good thing for the Soviet defenders. The streams of blazing oil from the bombed out oil tanks bypass Chuikov's command post, leaving huge clouds of black smoke. The smoke also clings to the riverbanks, Enormous clouds of clinging smoke that give the Soviets excellent camouflage. For the Germans, the German dive bomber pilots, do not think that anything can live within that smoke. And yet the Soviets are using that cover to bring men across the river and reinforce their positions. From September 25th to October 5th, over 160,000 soldiers crossed the Volga into Stalingrad. On October 4th, Friedrich Paulus begins his fourth and biggest series of attacks so far, now against the three gigantic factory fortresses, Krasny Oktyabr, Barricadi, and the tractor plant. Adolf Hitler has set a deadline of October 14th for taking the city. But you know, the first assault in mid-September was repulsed. Bigger ones on September 22nd and 27th had done a lot of damage and gained a lot of ground, but still had not won the battle. So now, in broader strategic terms, the Germans were now forced to take a considerable risk. By pulling so many of their troops out of the flanking positions on the Don and Kalmyk Steppe, they left themselves vulnerable to counterattack. Manstein highlighted the dangers of their position. They were relying too much on the weaker armies of their allies. It's true, the 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army are the main strike force of Army Group B. They're tied down in the city. Their whole northern flank on the Don is protected by a Romanian, a Hungarian, and an Italian army. Who in German command thinks they can fight off a large and determined Soviet attack? The same is true with the Romanian army on the southern flank. Time was now of the essence. An attempt to take Stalingrad in a set battle with such weak overextended flanks was only admissible on a very short-term basis. Paulus had to finish things off fast, all now hinged on whether the defenders could continue to hold out. The attacks starting the 4th are indeed from Barricadi to the tractor plant, and the 37th Guards and 308th Division fight to block them using T-70 tanks as stationary firing stations. On just October 5th, German dive bombers make over 2,000 attacks on the factory area. The Germans occupy the Silicat factory, and many Soviet defenders are cut off. Stalingrad front commander Andrei Yeromenko orders Chuikov to counterattack the 5th to clear Barricadi and the tractor plant. But you know, that's not possible. That evening, though, Filip Golikov, Yeromenko's deputy, crosses the river to see the city firsthand. 
since Joseph Stalin has ordered the city held and liberated. Golikov can see straight off that Chuikov cannot launch any sort of counterattack right now. But he can have 62nd Army's artillery, which Chuikov persuaded Yeromenko in September to leave on the East Bank, since it can't really be deployed in the city, do as much as it can to disrupt the German attack. So on the 5th, more than 300 guns and heavy mortars fired for 40 minutes. The artillery of five divisions and two brigades. The northern subgroup of front artillery and five regiments of Katyusha rocket launchers fired over a three kilometer sector. The opening salvos lasted 10 minutes, followed by 20 minutes of fire directed by observers on both banks and closing with 10 minutes of final smothering salvos from all available guns. The weight of this massed fire fell on German assault units preparing to break through to the Volga between the tractor plant and Barricadi. And because of this, the six is comparatively quiet since they deal the Germans out some pretty serious punishment. Comparatively quiet still means a lot of attacks by air though, but this convinces Yeromenko maybe the German attack is out of gas and they should now immediately counterattack. Chuikov is against this idea and wants to use any and all respite time to reinforce his units, but he eventually and reluctantly agrees to a counterattack on the 7th. He also moves his headquarters further up the Volga near the tractor plant since all the German shelling has been piling up the bodies in and around the old one. The counterattack the 7th does not go off though since two German divisions backed by tanks assault the tractor plant that day and by the day's end they've taken a block of the workers' apartments and moved towards the stadium. It's a big complex, it has a stadium. The 37th Guards Division has been receiving and blunting the factory district attacks and just this day wipe out four German battalions and some 20 panzers. 120 men of the 500 trapped last week in the Orlovka Gully managed to break free as the Orlovka salient finally falls for good on the 7th after being bombarded for five days. They fall back and join the defense of the tractor plant. The fighting eases again today, the 9th, and Paulus prepares for his once and for all final assault on the city that will be launched next week. But this battle, a set piece city block by block battle, goes against everything the Wehrmacht trains for. Remember Franz Halder lost his job as chief of staff a few weeks ago? He noted in his diary that the 6th Army and Armour are in a street fighting battle of attrition for which they are completely unsuited and Kurt Zeitzler, who replaced him, recommended straight off the bat that they call off the Stalingrad offensive. Paulus' own war games that he conducted in December 1940 had negative conclusions about the entire enterprise of attacking the USSR, and he's been complaining about shortages of men since early July. What does he think now in October? Well, a far from subtle hint to Paulus that great things awaited him after the capture of Stalingrad, conveyed by the newly appointed Schmunt, worked wonders on Paulus's flagging initiative. Here is David Glantz's summary of the situation, right? Paulus's Sixth Army solidified its grip on the upper sections of Krasny Oktyabr and Barakadi villages, totally eliminated the Soviet forces encircled at Orlovka, and drove a menacing wedge into Chuikov's 62nd Army in the western section of the tractor factory village on the southwestern approaches to the tractor factory. At the same time, the forces on Sixth Army's left wing fended off the Don Front's repeated assaults. 4th Panzer Army did the same in the lake region south of Stalingrad. However, elsewhere along Paulus's front, combat had degenerated into a virtual stalemate. Paulus has no choice but to delay his assault on the factories until next week. And this seems like his whole summer in microcosm. I mean, we saw in July, in August, and in September that at important times in his advance, he just plain did not have the necessary force to defeat the enemy without reinforcements. In previous battles, Paulus had received the necessary reinforcements and recorded meaningful victories. In the wake of each of those victories, however, the strength of his army ebbed, especially when it began assaulting Stalingrad city. Six armies' periodic strength and combat capability reports vividly describe the army's steady deterioration. And what about Chuikov? He's by now only got like 55,000 men 
950 artillery pieces and 500 mortars, and only around 80 tanks. The 8th Air Army has 188 planes, 101 bombers, 63 dive bombers, and 24 fighters, and that is not in any way going to chase off the over 1,000 planes of Luftflotte IV that the Germans have. They also have some 90,000 men and 300 tanks in the city, and as many as 2,000 artillery pieces and mortars. So what's Chuikov's defense plan? He holds a line from Renok in the north through the factory district, the northeastern slope of Mamayev Kurgan, and a few positions around the central station. He's only a few kilometers max from the Volga in the north, and recon points to the big attack being again against the factory complexes. So he moves the 95th Rifle Division off Mamayev Kurgan slopes and between the 37th Guards and 308th Rifle Divisions defending Krasny Oktyabr. Will Paulus's reinforcements once again be strong enough for the job? The job of destroying Chuikov's army once and for all. Down in the Caucasus, it turns out that Ewald von Kleist's forces are not up to the job of destroying their enemy. The SS Viking Division finally does take Malgobek on the 6th after 10 days of fighting to get there. After that, though, they shift to defense. The rest of Kleist's forces are still at the Mozdok bridgehead, large though it may be, opposite a solid Soviet front. By early October, it was obvious that Kleist's offensive had stalled and that his army would not get to Grozny anytime soon. Stavka also realized that the defenses on the Terek were sufficient to keep the Germans out of Grozny and sent its remaining reserves to the Stalingrad front. Hitler ordered the Luftwaffe to set the oil fields in Grozny ablaze and Fliegerkorps Vier mounted two large-scale raids. Although these inflicted serious damage, the effort was suspended. There are a lot of other troop movements going on this week in the South Pacific at Guadalcanal. All week long, the Tokyo Express has been bringing loads of Japanese troops by the hundreds into Tassafaranga. These are hard hit by the American planes of the Cactus Air Force, so by the 6th, reinforcement commander Shintaro Hashimoto thinks they're going to have a shortfall of 3,000 men for the next big attack. They push back X day for the attack to October 15th. But even for the men already there, Lieutenant General Maruyama came ashore at 8 p.m. on October 3rd at Tassafaranga and the next day established his battle headquarters on the Mamora River. There he learned that of the 9,000 men who had reached the island before him, 2,000 were already dead and 5,000 were too weak to conduct offensive warfare. The survivors of whole units lacked any equipment. Still, 17th Army has ordered Kiyotake Kawaguchi to occupy the east bank of the Matanikau River. So on the 4th, Maruyama gets busy planning and moving units into position. The U.S. Marines have a plan to advance along the coast to the Matanikau and then head down it and attack the enemy from the west, hopefully trapping substantial numbers of them. On the morning of the 7th, the attack force sets out, and there are skirmishes that day. By the afternoon of the 8th, the 7th Marines are on the west bank about a mile south of Point Cruz, but are forced to postpone their main attack. The Marine battalions hit the Japanese in the flank this morning, the 9th, and they do a heck of a job. For the three-day operation, the Marines lose 65 dead and 125 wounded. But the Japanese are not just driven from their positions, they are mauled to the tune of 690 men lost, and the 4th Infantry Regiment pretty much ceases to exist. Also today, the convoy carrying the 164th Infantry Regiment leaves Noumea. That regiment is part of the Americal Division, short for American New Caledonia Division, the first U.S. Army troops to head for Guadalcanal. Admiral Richmond Turner's command ship, Macaulay, an attack transport, leads it, escorted by Carrier Hornet's task force, with the addition of the battleship Washington. Sent ahead of them to reconnoiter the approaches to Lunga Point is Norman Scott's Task Force 64, four cruisers and six destroyers strong, who are on a search and destroy mission of enemy ships and landing craft. The convoy is scheduled to land the 13th. Scott arrives in Iron Bottom Sound already today, looking for action, but retires when aerial recon finds no enemy activity. And here are some notes to end the week. On the 3rd is the first successful launch of an A-4 rocket at Pianemunde, Germany. 
it reaches an altitude of 84 kilometers and is thus the first man-made object launched past the stratosphere. The 12-ton rocket can carry a one-ton warhead 320 kilometers away. This is Werner von Braun's brainchild. Adolf Hitler has been skeptical, but now he authorizes mass production. On the 4th comes a British commando raid on Sark in the Channel Islands. Three German engineers are killed. Five more struggle to escape their bonds when they realize how few their captors are. Three of them are shot. When Hitler gets word of this, he issues the commando order on the 7th. All commandos are to be killed upon capture. On the 7th, Britain and the U.S. announced that a U.N. commission will be established to investigate Axis war crimes. Conditions for any armistice must include that war criminals will be handed over and tried. On the 8th, since Germany's manpower crisis is deepening, in Belgium, all males 18 to 50 and all unmarried women 21 to 35 must register for war work. And that brings me to the end of another week of the war. A week of Japanese losses on Guadalcanal, Axis failure to advance in the Caucasus, and a whole lot of people dying on both sides in the bloody and brutal fighting for Stalingrad. Oh, Martin Gilbert points out there has actually been an American contribution at Stalingrad. Between May and October, the U.S. sent, mainly through Iran, 56,445 field telephones, 381,431 miles of telephone cable, and 81,287 Thompson machine guns. Well, the Soviets need all the help they can get just to hold out, for that is the plan, as we saw weeks ago, just to hold out. Zhukov says he can mount a counterattack and defeat the enemy, but it will take until November to get it together. And can 62nd Army hold out that long? The Germans are taking the factories one little building at a time, taking the city one little block at a time, and destroying the Soviet ability to reinforce one little boat at a time. The question is, how many little buildings, blocks, and boats can they take before November? Speaking of Paulus' war games, we did a special about them a while ago, and it's super interesting. You should go and check it out right here. And our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Robert J. Carbone. Something that is also super interesting is that the Time Ghost Army is what finances all of our productions. So join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.